I was raised to be independent and self-sufficient. That was my father's mantra, independent and self-sufficient. We're three girls and one boy, and now when we get together during Thanksgiving and debate over the Thanksgiving table, I joke around that it actually means stubborn and difficult. But what does it actually mean to be independent and self-sufficient? Well, self-sufficient is easy to understand, right? It's the ability to support myself financially. And from the moment I graduated from college, that was my goal. I got my first job at Vogue magazine. Wow, what an exciting place to be with the best of the best of fashion. Except I was only paid $22,000 a year. Now that's a really hard salary to be self-sufficient with in New York City. So I took a 400 square foot apartment with two other friends, shared a room with a, with a friend, and slept on a mattress on the floor. So mom, dad, I'm sorry that I never invited you over to that apartment. It was pretty disgusting and I was kind of embarrassed, but I was deeply intent on being self-sufficient. In fact, I was even able to save a little bit of money. And after four years at Vogue, I quit my job, cleared my bank account of all of my money, which was $5,000, and went backpacking around Asia for the year. This, I thought, was independence. I had my hiking boots on and my guidebook in hand and a bag full of books. Now, this was in 2005, so a time before smartphones and Kindles and, and iPads. In fact, I didn't even bring my cell phone with me. I was completely disconnected. You may think that $5,000 is a shoestring budget, but I thought it was a luxury. I had $13.50 to do whatever I wanted. I went to Nepal and hiked the Annapurna circuit, by far the hardest thing I'd ever done, going nearly 20,000 feet up in the air in snow-covered mountains. I went to Bagan in Miramar and biked around thousands of temples, 10,000 of them glowing in the orange sunset and have been for thousands of years. And I went to the floating market in Vietnam where the Mekong Delta's lush produce were sold by local distributors on boats. But by far the most inspiring moment I had was on a bridge in Guizhou, China, where I had a chance encounter. It's a pretty awesome bridge, huh? <laughs> there I met this woman who was making these amazing skirts. Now, they were completely different from any of the other skirts that I had seen in the area. And as she explained to me, each day she walked to this bridge where she had sold her very first skirt. And over time, she was able to sell more and more of those skirts. And as time passed, she was able to hire her sister to go to the local market where the tourists went and sell the skirts there. And when I came back home here to New York City and went to a store down the street from me, I saw that very skirt for sale in that, in that store. And it made me wonder, how could I help this woman connect with many stores like the one down the street from me in New York City? Asia was amazing, and honestly, I think you should all go there. It was an incredible experience. In fact, I loved it so much that I decided to move there. So I came back home, we packed my bags, and moved straight back to China. I lived in Shanghai for four years, well, I lived in Asia for, for four years, and I arrived in Shanghai with no friends, no home, no job, just showed up to make things happen. And that's when I started wondering, perhaps I misunderstood the word independence. So here's the dictionary definition of independence. Independent is an adjective, like an independent country. Sovereign, self-determining, self not unaligned, or it's an independent spirit maverick, bold, individualistic. Clearly I thought this was me, right? Except it didn't really seem to capture or embody what I saw happening around me. In fact, independent no longer felt like an adjective. So I'm going to challenge you to think of independent as a noun. By now you've probably heard of the maker movement. It's spawned by a generation of individuals eager to make things themselves. Adweek had my favorite definition of the maker movement. They speak of it being filled with computer hackers and artisans who are using open source learning and, and powerful personal technology like 3D printing. And my favorite part of this definition is its complete denigration of mass-produced, made-in-China merchandise. You see, a really important part of this movement are the personal stories. Why did someone create something? What was their inspiration? Which materials do they use and where do they source them from? Meet Shana Luther, for example. She creates her bags in Brooklyn through small batch manufacturing facilities. She sources her materials through US vendors. And she follows the philosophy of impeccable craftsmanship. Made in Brooklyn is an important part of her branding. And she's extremely proud of she's, how she's been able to create jobs in her local community. I believe that we all care about the products that we buy. 
It gives us something to talk about and believe in. It humanizes a product into a fulfilled dream. And I'd be willing to bet that all of you care too. Now, this may sound small because it's on such a personal level, but it's actually a ginormous market. So in the United States today, there are 135 million adults who are hobbyists. That means that 57% of the adult population, ages 18 and up, are makers. And in 2012, they spent $2.2 billion on maker services, things like 3D printing, electronics, metalworking. And on a global scale, this is a $29 billion market. The DIY market and maker movement emphasizes self-reliance and creativity. So you can understand why it fits into this conversation about independence and self-sufficiency, right? In fact, it puts STEM education into practice, especially amongst women. Now, this is the coolest part. Recent studies show that 77% of makers are women with an average age of 32. Now, I think it's critical for consumers to become creators. And apparently, President Obama agrees with me. Recently, this past summer, he hosted a maker fair at the White House, and there he said, your projects are examples of a revolution that's taken place in American manufacturing, a revolution that can help us create new jobs and industries for decades to come. I actually think that this is a global initiative. Now, today, with the speed at which one can design and produce a product, local manufacturing can happen anywhere and at any scale, be it tens or ten thousands. And since one is producing closer to home, the lead times are dramatically re reduced, and one is able to reorder more consistently. This means that makers and brands and businesses are able to work a lot more like a startup, build a product, test it in the market, and then iterate based on market feedback. So this is where I say welcome to the maker movement, right? Where artisans and hackers tinker together, where ideas are crowdsourced and money is crowdfunded to put those ideas into reality and make them happen. Where, the, where creation is completely democratized and through open source learning and the power of the crowd. Personally, my goal is to take a maker's business and scale it. I keep asking myself, how can I help that girl on the bridge in Guizhou, China sell to thousands of stores around the world? America is a nation of small businesses. In fact, there are 28 small businesses in the United States employing half a private sector and created two, creating two out of three new jobs. But what if we can enable that phenomenon to happen globally? Actually, what if we can enable that phenomenon to happen everywhere you're looking? That's where I say, that's where the maker movement is, that's where I say, the, sorry, that's where I say this is the rise of the independence, where the maker movement is at scale, where production moves from tens to ten thousands, and where the movement scales to be a global world of small businesses. Now, about a year and a half ago, I created a business called Modalist. Modalist is an online wholesale marketplace connecting smaller independent brands, like that girl on the bridge in Guizhou, China, to thousands of stores around the world, like the one down the street from me in New York City. Modalist takes the, the trade show industry and puts it online with a technology twist. I co-founded this business with my, with my business partner, Alain Miguel, because we believe in people's personal stories and we, love, and, and we love to find unique items. We created this business to help makers scale to be independents and reach their potential. And after just a year and a half, we have hundreds of designers, thousands of brands, and we're represented in over 120 countries. But how exactly did one scale before? Well, previously, brands met retailers at trade shows. Now, trade shows only happen twice a year. That means that brands only have two opportunities to sell their collections. Well, that seems slow, right? I mean, if you're going to produce and, and design and produce consistently throughout the year, wouldn't you also want to sell consistently throughout the year? Well, it turns out that that's especially important in fashion. Think of fashion like food. It's highly perishable and it goes bad quickly. So your first week you have this shiny red apple and it's delicious and you want to eat all of them up. And the next week it's kind of bruised and disgusting and the store could probably sell it for a discount. And the next week it's mealy and gross and the store is better giving it away just to save some room on the shelf. Well, fashion works exactly the same and a company like Zara is changing the way that we shop into a movement called fast fashion. And they focus on three key ingredients. 
First are the lower quantities, second, shorter lead times, and third are more styles more often. So first, let's talk about lower quantities. I believe that we're all trained to shop for things on sale, especially here in the US, right? I know for myself, I'll go to the store, I'll find a skirt that I love, and then I'll come back at the end of the season to buy it on sale. But if I knew that that skirt wouldn't be there at the end of the season, I'd buy it now, and I'd buy it at full price. Scarcity is awesome for margins. Second are the short lead times. Companies like Zara can design, produce, and deliver products more consistently throughout the year. That means that they're able to react to the trends instead of predicting them. That means that the market is actually leading the way. Zara can go from identifying a trend in the market to having it in store within 30 days. Now that's especially fast. And third, honestly, the more styles that are in the store, the more likely the store is going to get it right. Right? Instead of buying thousands and thousands of the same skirts, they're buying hundreds of variations. Well, it turns out that this is completely different from how it works today. When I was living in Asia, I managed the buying team for a large luxury department store called Harvey Nichols. Now, I went to market to buy product for that store six months in advance. Six months. So take that and add in the three to five months that it takes for any brand to design and produce their items, and you have nearly one entire year from the time a product is conceived to the time that it lands on the shelf. Now that's in stark contrast to Zara's 30-day comparison. It means the chances of a typical retailer having a shelf full of bad apples is extremely high. So why am I telling you about this, right? I mean, Zara is not an independent retailer, nor are they an independent brand, but what they have done it's changed the way that people shop. When I go to the store, I expect to find something new. It doesn't matter how big or how small that store is, I go there to find something new. And when 80% of customers are repeat customers, the goal is to bring me back into that store more often. Fast fashion retailers have completely changed the way that people shop and that we expect to find something new in the store all the time. Essentially, they've set the stage for more agile players to arrive. And that's where the maker movement comes into action. It's a whole generation of people creating awesome, cool products faster than ever before. Makers are those agile players who can fill those stores with awesome, cool products filled with unique stories. So what I'm asking you today is to think of independent as a noun. Independence, self-learners and entrepreneurs, an optimist with a can-do it belief, ready to enact change and make stuff happen, and their maker movement at scale. Privately owned businesses built around a creative hobby which attracts the hearts and the imaginations of their audience. Thank you very much.